brought your Bibles, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 3, or you can follow on the screen, it'll be up here shortly. We're going to read what the Gospel writer Matthew wrote about Jesus' baptism. Okay, and it starts at verse 13, only goes to 17, only four verses today, all right, Mark? Okay, all right. This is what Matthew records. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it's proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he was coming up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. I just want to clarify immediately at the top of my sermon that I'm not a psychiatrist and I'm not a psychologist, okay? But I have seen people on the internet, all right, who probably professional mental care providers should label as nutcases. That's right, I said it in church. I said it in church, nutcases. Nutcases, you know who I'm talking about. Polar bears. Polar bears. And I don't mean the real bear-type polar bear, no. I mean those people who decide that the best way to celebrate the New Year is by finding a semi-ice-covered body of water and jumping on in. Nutcases! That's what I'm talking about today. Nutcases. Mark, don't, don't get up and go. Don't be upset at me. I already clarified I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, so you got to forgive me, brother. <laughs> I mean, I think there must be some sanity gene missing uh, from these folks. I, I mean, I read about the mishaps that take place in some of these annual polar bear swims. I mean, people will jump into freezing water and have a heart attack right away. I mean, goodness, I'd rather have it in a nice warm room. All right, let's be honest. Let's be honest. All right, I'd rather do that. All right. But they also have a Let's see, frostbite, that's something, that's something you want to deal with right away, yeah. I mean, how about uh, chill blames? Anyone heard of those? You don't know? No, I don't even know what it is. But you know what? Just It was written down as one of the things people get, and I said, I never want to have this. Doc, you probably know, but do you want to treat me for it? No, no. Uh -uh. I don't even know where you can get them on your body, but I don't want them on my body. <laughs> Jump into freezing water. And they keep doing it every year. They keep doing it. Anyone remember ever not hearing about someone jumping in a frozen lake on New Year's Day? Anyone remember ever that? No. So it's longer than any of us have been alive. We've been alive for quite a while. Jay, not so much, but, you know, the rest of us. You're the youth group. <laughs> you have been around. But it's been around for a long time I'm talking about here. And it's not so bad that they go out and do this, all right? This crazy thing at New Year's time. They just got through with it. They're still drying off, being treated for frostbite, heart attack, and chill blames, I'm sure. What makes it bad for me is they keep evangelizing about it. They celebrate it. Oh, yeah, they do. They, they bubble over with enthusiasm and talking about it, and they invite other people to join them. They say, come on in. The water's fine. That's what they say. But I've got to tell you, I'm always suspicious when anyone tells me that. I, I've often tried to get my granddaughters down to the river, and sometimes they'll wear their boots. I say, great, you wore your boots, so let's go down by the river. Not with you, because they know I'm a pusher. <laughs> yeah, that's how me and my brothers used to do our polar bearing. We'd go down by the river in the winter, and someone was going to come back already polar bearing by surprise, fully dressed. But I mean, even in the summer heat, when a friend has a swimming pool party, you know, or, or at the lake or something, and they say, 
Don't worry, Tim. The water's fine. I don't trust them. They're already committed. They're already, you know, head wet. Once you're head wet, you know, you're committed. All right? Because I don't like plunging into chilly water. I don't get into a tepid shower. It's got to be hot. I'll stand outside. Wait on it. I'll wait on it. All right? And you might say, hey, Tim, you know, it's so refreshing, you know, whenever you've been sweating all day in the summer and it's 101, it's so refreshing to jump into a pool. And i got to tell you, though, I'm still reluctant. I'm still reluctant. I don't like to get my hair wet. All right? I don't like to get my hair wet. So that's just the way I am. I don't like to shiver, especially. I don't like to be shivering cold. And I don't like to lose feeling in my toes either. But I gotta admit, I have to admit to you, whenever they're all excited about this polar bear and stuff, I feel like I don't, I don't like being left out. I don't like being left out. They're so excited about it when they're talking about it. There's a big group of them doing it. You get quite excited about it. And it looks like it's fun. All right, they're having fun. They're all giddy about it. And there I am just standing on the shore watching in my heavy winter coat and, you know, mud boots. But and sometimes I wonder, is my, is my desire to join in the party going to override my sanity? All right? And I'm going to go running in with them. Jump on in. Maybe wade in a little slowly. But I don't. I don't. Polar bears. John the Baptist stood on the waters of the Jordan River. He stood on the waters of the Jordan River and he shouted out to everyone and anyone, come on in, the water's fine. He shouted it out. Hundreds, hundreds upon hundreds would join him in that water. Now others stood on the shore, and he had some words for them. Those on the shore, that ain't part of our text today, so we ain't going to talk about it. Today we want to look at one person who took John up on coming on into the water. Took him up, took up John on this invitation and joined him in the water. But before I want to acknowledge that there are a whole lot of issues that grow out of this little gospel moment that Matthew records here. A whole lot of issues in the church. I can't pretend to deal with them all here. And uh, you all know how serious people can get set into an argument or a discussion about the theology of the sacrament of baptism. Right? They argue over infant baptism versus believer's baptism. All right. Plenty will argue all day about it. All right. They'll also argue about the sprinkle or the pour method or the immersion. They'll do that. That's normally followed by those people who are really technical and go the way of the liturgy and say, well, why do you guys say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Can't you just say in the name of Jesus? I mean, all, all these matters have been disagreed upon for centuries. All right? They've been, they've been played out. All right? There's, they're no closer to resolution today than they were when they started, you know, thousands of years ago at the beginning. If you believe that I can resolve all those issues in my 15-minute sermon today, uh, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe not just resolve them, maybe you just want to debate me about them. I'm going to tell you you're incorrect on both accounts. All right? You're just wrong. I ain't going to do either today. I'm not going to resolve your problems, and I ain't going to debate about them, about baptism. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Because I've made a covenant to believe and live as a United Methodist Christian. Okay? The United Methodist Church holds to the validity of infant baptism. 
but it also accepts those who choose believer's baptism as well. Okay? The United Methodist Church recognizes that a majority of churches lean towards sprinkling. But at the same time, those same churches will take baptism uh, candidates over to another church and immerse them there or take them to a body of water or a pool and do it that way if that's what that person is wanting. Is there an outward manifestation of this inward change that we call baptism? The United Methodist Church uses a liturgy that's provided in our book of discipline, it's provided in our book of worship, and it's even written in our hymnals. All right, that does say, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But our church also acknowledges that our understanding of the sacrament as a whole comes from Jesus directly. And you know what? Regardless of the way it's performed, who it's performed with at what age, or what is said, I find meaning in all of it. I do. I find justification for baptizing in a variety of ways, in a variety of settings, and in a variety of words. But I've got to tell you, there's one dimension of it that I feel has to be present in the way that I think about baptism. Okay? This is what I think. When Jesus climbs down the bank, of the Jordan, gets into the river, John the Baptist was shocked. He was shocked. Okay? I don't know how John the Baptist knows who Jesus is. More than likely, they didn't grow up together. They were from different places. Our Bibles tell us Mary had to travel to get to where Elizabeth, John's mother, was. They're both... Elizabeth's about to have a baby. Mary's just finding out she's going to bear a child. Had that angel visit. They didn't grow up together. I don't know how he knows who Jesus is whenever Jesus comes over the bank and approaches him in the water. We're not told, are we? We're not told. I think maybe it's something from their shared family history that gave John the clue as to who was standing in front of him. Maybe it was a whisper from the Holy Spirit that John gets at that time as he's standing in the water and Jesus' approach. And what he heard made him think that something was wrong in the way this scene was playing out. Or maybe there's just something about the face of Jesus. There's just something about the face of Jesus that caused, same thing that caused fishermen to leave their nets and broken people to reach out in hope and powerful people to tremble in their boots and this wild man from the desert to want to fall on his knees in the midst of a river and be blessed by him instead of attempting to confer a blessing upon him. We don't know. We don't know what happened to cause John to say what he said or cause Matthew to record what he wrote. But something did. Some sense of what was right and what was wrong. And John the Baptist's sense of what was right was that Jesus should be the one blessing. Should be the one baptizing. And yet Jesus says, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. I always wonder about that, let it be so now. I mean, what does that mean? What does that mean? Let it be so now. And what is this righteousness that Jesus is trying to fulfill? Those are good questions to have from this text, friends. The truth is, 
Here you go. We don't really know. How about that? How about that for a good answer from the pulpit today? <laughs> Biblical scholars have some guesses, and some are more certain than others. But to get down to it, we don't really know. We don't really know. But I can't tell you what makes sense to me. And you feel it out yourselves. All right? You feel it out yourselves. Jesus is saying, I want to join the party. I want to join the party. I want to be seen joining the party. I want my ministry, my life, my witness to be one about becoming a part of the body. About joining up with this kingdom of God that you started preaching about, John. I want to be a part of it, and I want people seeing that I want to be a part of it. John the Baptist, we know. And you might not be as familiar with this. Uh, the people who were in uh, Bible study, we, we went over this kind of heavy. John the Baptist starts a spiritual revival in Israel. I'm going to tell you what, it's, it's, it's more of a movement, if you will. This is a big movement, all right? This is a nation that's desperate for something, something, some identity, and John brings it. And he calls for change, a change that they all seem to understand is needed. Whether you're the born highest, richest, you know, powerful person, or lowest, forgotten, It's for you. We all need to change, John proclaims. And they come to hear it, and they feel the movement. And as the people chosen by God, they finally figure out we are still sinners and need to ask God for forgiveness. John convinces them of this. This is why we're in the condition we're in. And they say, we want to be part of it. And Jesus steps forward into this time into this preparation phase, this spiritual movement of the entire nation, Jesus steps in and takes a baton and runs with it. That's what we see here. Now, i got to tell you, I think John's hesitation has to do with his understanding of baptism has a means of repentance, of a means of forgiveness, and a means of forgiving of sins. That's what baptism meant to John. All right? And Jesus, in John's understanding, had no need of it. Jesus did not need to repent, for he lived a sinless life. Okay? I want you to understand that. So what would make John change his mind? we got two sentences that seem to do it. What would make John change his mind? Why would he consent to this baptism? Well, maybe he saw in Jesus a bigger picture. That Jesus understood what was happening at a larger level. All right, maybe John and maybe most of us just think of repentance as a, a turning away, right? When we repent, we turn away from sin, right? From our life of sin that we've been leading to that moment. And we're sorry for what had gone on before. Whether we knew we were sinning or not, we now feel regret. All right? For me, it was whenever I was 17. Okay, I don't know when it was for you. But I mean, at that time, we're sorry for what we've done before. And we're now pledging to not engage in those behaviors again. Is that how most people understand? All right, repentance. Everyone? Yeah? Anyone in disagreement? No? Thank you for raising a hand there, Pentecostal. Uh, <laughs> Aaron. No. What if Jesus understood repentance different from what we do? You ever thought about that? 
What if he thought of repentance not as turning away, but turning toward? Turning toward. I'm going to justify this. Don't get, don't get up and go home. I see you grabbing coats. What if the gesture that Jesus was making was one of inclusion? Inclusion, friends. What if it was one of acceptance or entrance into? I mean, this is the beginning moment for the ministry that Jesus would perform. And so he's starting it out the same way. He's going to do all of the rest of his ministry from here on out. I mean, he's got a sign here that he's doing something new. He's doing something new. John the Baptist was doing something revolutionary in the nation. Baptizing God's chosen people. Telling them that they would sin and need to baptize and repent. Jesus, likewise, is about to launch something new. And this new thing is nothing less than the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. It's nothing less than a new way of living in community. Jesus is showing it. He's showing it. Because, friends, righteousness refers to being faithful to relationships. The greatest of the commandments is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And to what? Love our neighbor as ourselves. Yeah. Love God and love neighbor. You can't do that if you're all by yourself. You've got to be in community, in relationship, right? We're in relationship and in community right here. And we're in a bigger community. And my friends, you can't be righteous all by yourself. You can't be right with God and your neighbor if you're by yourself. We need to be in community. You're righteous with God and righteous with another. And righteousness implies community. So the necessary requirement for baptism, this is a requirement that you'll see listed in the United Methodist Church in the book of worship, is community. How many of you have ever been to a baptism? I did a little girl, a baby girl right over here, right? right? You, you, a lot of you guys were here for that. All right, so you've all been to baptism. That means a person being baptized. And I'm not talking just your own, all right, because I know you showed up for your own baptism. All right, I get that much, Mark. Come on, stop being upset with me. What I'm talking about is you showed up to support someone else. Whether you knew them or not, you showed up. You were in their community. You're part of the kingdom of God. You shared love. You shared something valuable to you, your time. All right? You gave the gift of your participation. Baptism is a corporate act. I mean, it's almost always done as a part of worship, but if we have to take someone somewhere else because they want immersion, we don't have an immersion uh, facility here. We'd have to take them somewhere else. When we do, we go with them, don't we? Because we love them. And we were just like them at one time and knew we needed support and a change. And we became their community. And baptism is an entrance into this fellowship, this fellowship of believers. It's a joining up with the body. And once you've been baptized, you are never alone. You're never alone. God is with us. We talked about Jesus' name, didn't we? Jesus means God saves. And Emmanuel means what? God is with us. God with us. We, come on, we just had seven weeks of hearing about that. Come on now. The God who saves is with us. How long did Jesus say he'd be with us? To the very end. And this is someone who knows eternity. So I can't even guess where the end is. <laughs> when we're baptized, families all around us, more than just blood and kin, the family of God is around us and supports us. Because we've joined something larger than ourselves, something 
that's startling yet worthwhile. Because someone told us to come on in, the water's fine. 